evaluate today is a work that shakes the fundamental assumptions about the distinction between the scientific and the non-scientific. Yes, it is a work that questions concepts such as verification, induction, and causality, particularly those of classical positivism and the Vienna Circle. It also challenges the fundamental assumptions about how scientific knowledge develops. The fundamental assumptions about the linear growth of scientific knowledge are being questioned. It is definitely a highly acclaimed work. We can easily say it is one of the most influential books on the philosophy of science in the 20th century. The assumptions in the book are conclusions drawn from Kuhn's research as a historian of science. His studies on scientific discoveries do not align with traditional assumptions about how scientific knowledge progresses. You know, the idea that knowledge is accumulated simply by building on existing knowledge. Okay, let's get into it. It's a really vital shift in perspective because that traditional view you mentioned, the one we get from textbooks mostly, it frames science as this piecemeal process. You know, facts, laws, theories just get added to the ever-growing stockpile, and historians are supposed to just figure out who found what and when. Like they're just checking items off a list, right? Like trying to pinpoint the exact A oxygen was discovered or who first thought of energy conservation. Seems simple, but Kuhn makes it complicated. He points out that studying history makes answering those questions harder, not easier. And here's the fascinating part. He says we have a choice if old ideas like Aristotle's physics or the phlogiston theory, you know, the idea that fire involved releasing a substance called phlogiston, if those were just myths, then they were created using the same kinds of methods we use now for science. But if they were science back then, well, that means science has included beliefs totally incompatible with what we believe today. So the simple adding bricks idea doesn't hold up. Exactly. It makes that cumulative picture really problematic. Kuhn argued that this textbook image is fundamentally misleading. Science doesn't just grow by piling up discoveries. Okay, so if it's not just adding things up, what is happening? This brings us to Kuhn's concept of normal science, doesn't it? It does. Normal science, for Kuhn, is the day-to-day -day stuff. It's research firmly based upon one or more past scientific achievements, achievements that a specific scientific community accepts, for a while anyway, as the foundation for everything else they do. Like Newton's Principia, or Lavoisier's chemistry. Those landmark works, precisely those works often found in textbooks, implicitly define what counts as a legitimate problem and what are the accepted methods for tackling it. And the core of this normal science is the paradigm. That's a huge concept for Kuhn. It's not just a theory, is it? It feels bigger. Oh, much bigger. The paradigm is absolutely key. It's more than a theory, more than rules. It's a concrete scientific achievement that becomes the focus of professional commitment. Think of it less like a blueprint you just copy and more like a landmark legal case in common law. It sets a precedent. It's an object for further articulation and specification under new or more stringent conditions. It guides research without spelling everything out. So it's not a static map, but more like an evolving guidebook that shapes how scientists explore. That's a really good way to think about it. Yeah. And within that guidebook, normal science becomes what Kuhn called puzzle solving. He described it as a strenuous and devoted attempt to force nature into the conceptual boxes supplied by professional education. Forcing nature into boxes, right? The main goal isn't finding totally new things or inventing radical new theories. It's more like mop-up work, extending the reach and the accuracy of the current paradigm. That sounds almost a bit boring. If it's not about big discoveries, why are scientists so dedicated to it? That's a great question. Why the passion if you're just mopping up, Kuhn says. It's because even if scientists often know roughly what result to expect, the challenge lies in how to get there. It's the ingenuity needed to solve the puzzle. It's the belief that if they're clever enough, they will find a solution within the paradigm's rules. The thrill of the chase, even within established boundaries. Exactly. And paradigms also define which puzzles are worth solving, 
the ones assumed to have solutions within the paradigm. This can sometimes mean ignoring really important societal problems if they don't fit the current puzzle format. And these paradigms, they guide research even without explicit rules being written down everywhere. That's right, they create this strong network of commitments. Yes, explicit laws like Newton's are part of it, but so are preferred instruments and how to use them. Even deeper things, quasi-metaphysical commitments, like the old idea that everything is made of tiny particles. Kuhn argued paradigms work like Wittgenstein's idea of family resemblance. Think about the word game. There's no single definition covering all games, but we recognize them. Similarly, scientific problems and methods relate through modeling and shared examples from education, not always strict rules. Nature doesn't always cooperate, does it? It doesn't always fit neatly into those conceptual boxes. Precisely. And that's where the cracks start to show. That leads us to anomalies. Anomalies, the things that just don't fit. Exactly. Remember, normal science does not aim at novelties and when successful finds none. But still new and unsuspected phenomena are repeatedly uncovered. An anomaly is something the paradigm simply didn't prepare the scientists to see. So the paradigm creates expectations, and anomalies are the violations of those expectations. And Kuhn stressed that noticing an anomaly, discovering it, isn't just one moment. No, it's a process, a complex one. It involves recognizing both that something is and what it is. Often these happen at different times to different people. Right, like oxygen. Perfect example. Priestley found a gas, but working within the old phlogiston theory, he called it deaf logisticated air. He saw something. But Lavoisier, who is already questioning the phlogiston theory, he was sort of prepared to discover something new. He saw oxygen and rebuilt chemistry around it. That advance awareness of difficulties was key. And x-rays? Another great case. Rotengen's screen glowed when, according to known physics, it shouldn't have. X-rays caused surprise and even shock. Why? Because they violated expectations baked into the procedures and instruments themselves, even if no specific theory forbade them. Okay, so you get these anomalies popping up, and if enough of them resist explanation within the old paradigm, then you get a crisis. Crisis comes from the persistent failure of the puzzles of normal science to come out as they should. Things get messy. The paradigm starts to look blurred. The rules for research loosen up. People start trying slightly different approaches. Like tweaking the theory to make it fit. Exactly. Classic sign of crisis is the proliferation of versions of a theory. Think about the phlogiston theory again. Chemist kept inventing new types of phlogiston to explain away weird results with gases and weight changes. It's interesting the very rigidity of normal science, the thing that resists change. That's also what makes it super sensitive when something is fundamentally wrong. That resistance means anomalies have to be really persistent, really deep before scientists consider ditching the paradigm. That's a crucial insight of Kuhn's that resistance isn't just stubbornness. It ensures the foundations are truly shaken before a revolution happens. And history is full of these crises. Ptolemaic astronomy got incredibly complicated and inaccurate before Copernicus proposed a whole new system, the phlogiston theory, buckling under the weight of new chemical discoveries or the struggle to detect the ether the supposed medium for light waves, which paved the way for Einstein's relativity. These weren't just small problems. They were fundamental breakdowns. And these breakdowns, these crises, they set the stage for the main event. Scientific revolutions. Absolutely. Revolutions are the moments of paradigm shift. They are changes in the rules governing the prior practice of normal science. They fundamentally transform the scientific imagination, Kuhn says. It's like a transformation of the world within which scientific work was done. You need to reconstruct theories, reevaluate old facts. He heard it to political revolutions, didn't he? He did. Just like a feeling grows that existing political institutions are failing, 
leading to crisis in science. The failure of the old paradigm leads to crisis. And crucially, he said, a decision to reject one paradigm is always simultaneously the decision to accept another. You don't just abandon the old ways without having a new way forward. It's not just swapping one theory for a better one. Then, it's a whole new way of operating a new scientific reality, which leads to maybe his most controversial idea, incommensurability. Yeah, that's a big one. Incommensurability. It means competing paradigms are like incompatible modes of community life. They don't just disagree on the answers, they often disagree on the questions. What are the legitimate problems? What counts as a valid solution? Even the meaning of basic terms can change. Wow. Think about mass. For Newton, mass is conserved. For Einstein, mass is convertible with energy. They might measure similarly at low speeds, but conceptually they must not be conceived to be the same. Yeah, so it's almost like scientists working under different paradigms are speaking different languages, looking at the same experiment, but interpreting it in ways the other side literally can't fully grasp. That's a very good way to put it. They might use the same words, mass, element, space, but the meanings, the network of concepts they fit into are different. Communication breaks down, and this leads to perhaps Kuhn's most bending claim. When paradigms change, the world itself changes with them. Okay, hold on. The world changes. In a sense, yes. He means scientists see new and different things when looking with familiar instruments in places they have looked before. The raw data might be similar, but how it's perceived and structured changes. This is where it gets really wild. You mentioned those optical illusions earlier, like the duck rabbit picture, where suddenly you flip from seeing one to seeing the other. Exactly. Kuhn uses analogies like that. He talks about psychology experiments like Bruner and Postman showing people anomalous playing cards, say, or a red six of spades. What happened? People get confused, misidentify it, take longer to recognize it, or people wearing special glasses that invert everything. At first, the world is upside down and chaotic, but eventually their brains adapt and the world flips back to looking normal. Even with the glasses on, their perception actually changes, right? Kuhn suggests something similar happens in science. Our sensory experience is not fixed and neutral. It's partially determined by the paradigm. And he had real scientific examples of this seeing differently. Oh, definitely. Think about Galileo and the pendulum before him. People following Aristotle saw a swinging stone as basically an object falling, but being impeded, constrained, fall. Galileo, influenced by different ideas about impetus, saw a pendulum, an object repeating a regular motion. He didn't just measure better, he saw a different kind of phenomenon. Kuhn says pendulums were brought into existence by something very like a paradigm-induced gestalt switch. Wow. So the concept pendulum allowed him to perceive the motion differently. Precisely. Or Uranus. It had been spotted on and off for nearly a century, catalogued as a faint star or maybe a comet. But after Herschel's work in 1781 and within a changing astronomical paradigm, it was suddenly seen as a planet. The object was the same, but its perceived identity and place in the cosmos changed fundamentally. So these revolutions really reshape perception. But if they're so dramatic, why don't we always notice them? Why does science history often feel so smooth? Kuhn had an answer for that, too. He blamed the textbooks. The textbooks again? Yep, he argued. Scientific revolutions are often made nearly invisible because textbooks of science systematically disguise their existence and significance. Textbooks are for teaching the current paradigm, so they rewrite history to make it look like a smooth, linear path leading directly to today's knowledge. They present science as largely cumulative. They flatten out the bumps and revolutions. Exactly. They might credit old scientists with ideas they never really had in the modern sense. Or downplay the radical breaks, like attributing the modern concept of a chemical element directly to Robert Boyle, when his use of the term was actually part of an argument against the existence of such elements as then conceived. So the way we learn science itself kind of hides the revolutionary history. 
we get the sanitized straight line story. Pretty much. Which leads to Kuhn's final big question. What about scientific progress? If it's not a straight line to the truth, what is it? Right. Science seems to progress in a way art or philosophy might not. Why? Well, within normal science, progress is pretty much guaranteed because everyone in the community agrees on the goals, the methods, the paradigm. They focus intensely on solving those puzzles. That efficiency ensures progress within the paradigm. Okay, progress during normal science makes sense. But what about across revolutions? This is where Kuhn offers that really profound reinterpretation. He suggests progress isn't evolution toward anything, not marching towards some final ultimate truth with a capital T. So not goal-directed. Not in that sense. Instead, he frames it more like Darwinian evolution, evolution from primitive beginnings. Each stage, each new paradigm that survives a revolution, is marked by an increase in articulation and specialization. Science gets better at solving certain kinds of puzzles, the ones defined by the current paradigm. Like species adapting to specific environments. Exactly. We end up with this wonderfully adapted set of instruments we call modern scientific knowledge. But it's the result of evolving from what came before, adapting to solve problems better, not necessarily getting closer to one fixed endpoint. So Thomas Kuhn completely reframes our view. Science isn't that steady climb up a mountain towards a single peak. It's more like periods of intense work on one plateau. Normal science followed by these dramatic ground-shifting earthquakes. Revolutions that move the whole landscape, revealing new vistas and new problems. That's a great summary. It's a dynamic historical process. So what's the takeaway for you listening to this if you're trying to get your head around complex fields? I think it's understanding that science is profoundly human. It's shaped by history, by shared beliefs, by these revolutionary breaks. It's not just a collection of objective facts dropped from the sky. It encourages you to look critically, maybe even question the smooth narrative, sometimes present it. And here's a final thought to chew on. If paradigms shape not only how we do science, but maybe even how we perceive nature itself, if our facts are dependent on the paradigm we're using, what does that really mean for a scientific objectivity? Is truth something we discover out there, fixed and final? Or is it something that evolves along with our scientific frameworks? What does it mean to seek truth when the very lens we used to see the world can fundamentally shift? Something to think about. Keep these ideas in mind next time you read about a scientific breakthrough. Or look back at the history of ideas. Yes, as we close the program, let us wish you all days filled with books.